Hello, everyone. Uh, Happy New Year and welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Hal Avinka and I'm the event director at the bookstore. And I'm absolutely thrilled today to be collaborating with our friends at NYRB Classics and Repeater for a joint discussion of Uwe Janssen through the lens of Patrick Wright's new book, The Sea View Has Me Again, Uwe Janssen in Sheerness, and Janssen's own masterpiece, Anniversaries, translated by Damien Searles. And of course, Patrick and Damien are joined tonight by our esteemed moderator, NYRB Classics editor, Edwin Frank. While the pandemic has taken a toll across all of our lives, virtual programs like the one you're about to see have become bright spots in our days. And I want to give a huge thanks to our panel for joining us this evening. So to some housekeeping before we get started, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot see or hear you. So if you have any questions, please click on the Q&A button here at the bottom of the screen to submit them. Um, We'll try to get through as many of those as we can at the end of the program. There's also a chat button down here where I'll be posting a link to buy tonight's books from our store, uh, you know, as well as links for uh, various upcoming programming. Uh, A caveat for tonight's event and for all virtual events, we are at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads, so please bear with any technical issues that could arise. We will try to solve them quickly. And we are hitting the ground running this month with our spring virtual programming, so head over to our website and sign up for our newsletter to find out more. One program that I want to spotlight next Thursday, January 14th, we'll be hosting a panel discussion for NYRB Classics' new edition of Leonora Carrington's The Hearing Trumpet, which instantly came out today. So registrations for that event are live now, and you can sign up on our website. So now a little about our panel, and we'll get started. Patrick Wright is the uh, Emeritus Professor of Literature, Culture, and Politics at King's College London. His books include The Village That Died for England, A Journey Through Ruins, and Tank, The Progress of a Monstrous War Machine. Damien Searles is a translator more recently of Rilke's Letters of a Young Poet, now for the first time with the letters to Rilke and a writer. His own books include What We Were Doing and Where We Were Going and The Ink Blots. Uh, he uh, received the Helen and Kurt Wolf Prize and the MLA's Louis Roth Award and his translation of Uwe Janssen's Anniversaries. Um, and Edwin Frank is the founder and editor of the NYRB Classic Series and the author of a book of poems, Snake Train. So, panelists, the stage is yours. Thank you, Hal. Thank you, everybody, for, for showing up. Uh, and uh, thanks, Damien and uh, Patrick. Um, so we're going to talk about um, Patrick's book, The Sea View Has Me Again, about Uwe Janssen in Sheerness. A, um, and, uh, and then also about Uwe Janssen and Anniversaries. Anniversaries is uh, an extraordinary book. I mean, it's a book that is a successor to to Proust and Joyce, and is also a book unlike anything else in in, in uh, modern literature or literature altogether. And Patrick's book is also a quite extraordinary book. Um, its starting point is simple enough, which is that Uwe Janssen in the early seventies um, went to live on the island of the Isle of Sheppey in the town of Sheerness, uh, which are part of, in Kent in England. Um, and this seemed, he'd been given a little bit of money by uh, the, the writer uh, Max Frisch, who's also his friend. And this seemed an odd place for a writer who was, um, who'd already published, had he already done the three volumes of anniversaries at that point? He had, hadn't he? Um, yeah, and who had made, whose work was already recognized as, um, as, you know, one of the defining works of modern, of contemporary German literature at that point. Patrick's book uh, sort of wonders, explores the reason what he did there. It talks about how he lived there. It talks, but it's much more than that. It's also a book about the island. It's, it's uh, the history, it's history, really it's history going back uh, to several centuries. Uh, it is a book about England uh, and the social changes that have, in some sense, brought us to Brexit today. Um, it's also it's um, a book. Finally, it's it's a completely individual work of literary criticism, which reminds us which which uh, changes our views of of uh, anniversaries and shows us once again how great literature is, in some sense, news that stays news. It's a real accomplishment in its own right. And um, so I thought we'd begin by um, turning to Damien to talk about, tell us a little bit more about Uwe Janssen and then turning to Patrick to tell us about Sheerness, uh, great name for a town, Sheerness. 
um, and uh, and uh, and then we'll have some readings and discuss after that. So, Damien. Thanks, Edwin. Um, mostly just to build on what you said, um, Uwe Janssen was a was an international literary star and had been for a decade and a half. Um, he published his first book, Speculations About Jacob, when uh, he was 26 years old. And um, the, the, I think like quickest thumbnail of his reputation is that uh, in 1960, a consortium of international publishers decided to found a new prize that would be the sort of more up-to-date hip modern Nobel Prize. I mean, just sort of think of deciding to start the Booker Prize or something. They called it the International Publishers Prize. And the first year was awarded in 1961. It was split between um, Jorge Luis Borges and Samuel Beckett. So that's what we're talking. The second year was awarded in 1962. It went to 27 year old Uwe Janssen. So that's the um, status he had in the early 60s publishing several novels in quick succession and then launching on this project anniversaries, which ended up being quite big, partly because it started with this ambitious scheme of covering a year in the life of its main characters, the 34 year old woman and her 10 year old daughter from Germany living in New York. And it covers a year from August 20th, 1967 to 68 and every day is a chapter. So there are gonna be 367 chapters because there are two August 20ths and 1968 is a leap year. So you can't get away with just 366 chapters. Um, not to get into the book too much, but in terms of its writing, he was extremely fast. So the first volume which covered four months of this year for, so a third of 360 whatever chapters uh, came out in 1970, very quickly after 67 to 68 when it takes place. The second volume, which was the next four months was 1971. And the third volume of what was supposed to be a trilogy was announced for 1972. Um, then he postponed it for a year and then in 1973, he ended up publishing only months nine and 10. So uh, half of what was supposed to be the final volume and said, well, the last two months will come in a volume four. And that took him until 1983. So you have 70, 71, half of it in 73, and then this 10 year gap and it's, somewhere near the beginning of that 10 year gap that he moves to Sheerness. So already there were signs kind of intrinsic in his work that something was shifting or stalling or, or whatever was going on. And so then th the fact that he left Berlin where he was an absolute literary lion, um, not to move to New York, which people could sort of understand in Germany, but to move to Sheerness was extremely mystifying. And certainly from the German perspective, there was this sense, you know, why is he moving to this you know, worthless dump of a town that no one's ever heard of? Um, that sort of framed the German impression of what Sheerness was. And frankly, the international sense of anyone who read Uwe Janssen and knew he went to Sheerness sort of absorbed without really thinking about it, this kind of ideology that it was a dump uh, and a ridiculous place to move to. And so that is the sort of low point at which Patrick steps in and starts really reclaiming and telling the story of, of sheerness. And um, you know the fact that Uwe Janssen said things about sheerness such as calling it a moral utopia was seen at the time as very contrarian and kind of prickly and obviously not meant literally, who could possibly mean it literally. But Patrick, you came along to really take it seriously and look at it. 
Yeah, I would say, by the way, that people, I think, would have had no idea where Sheerness was at all. And I don't think they would have even known of it as a dump in general, but I mean, because Sheerness- well, well, I tell you, we, we knew about it in, um, in Kent, the rest of Kent. Yeah. It's great, this, but, and, and I'd like to thank you both for, for, for giving this project time because Damien, particularly, and I have been working on this. Damien did the translations in this book. So, um, you know, we've been, we've been going back and forth on it for probably seven or eight years, in fact, from start to finish of this project. But let me, let me just read a little passage because I think that'll help establish the tone which I found among people who live in Sheerness, who, you know, they, they knew this man was there, but they knew nothing about him. You know, they, he was very withheld. He didn't, he made friends among working class people in the bars. He developed a name for himself. He, they couldn't pronounce his name. They, they, they couldn't say Uwe Jonsten. They kept calling him Yui. So, you know, they didn't know that if you take a Hoover and knock the H off, you get quite close to Uwe, but still not very good. So he said to them, call me Charles. He introduced himself as Charles Henry. Um, which was a Faulknerian name, I believe. I mean, William Faulkner was one of his great mentors. And he moved into the bars and he lived a life um, of a, as a kind of German odd researcher with his wife and daughter together there with, with him. But people, people who remembered him knew nothing about his writing. They knew nothing about what had happened to him. They didn't really understand the difficult circumstances of his death and his marital breakup. So let me, let me just give you a, a little couple of paragraphs which will give you a sense I think of what I was finding as I started moving around the place. As a poor and much denigrated town on a shore where England ends and the wider world no longer begins, this was once a naval town, Sheerness may never have been the easiest place in which to sell a house. In January 2012 however Catherine Bishop had an unusual reason to feel mo modestly optimistic as she blogged about her large family home in the late Victorian district known as Marine Town. The upper stories of the four or five bedroom Victorian terraced house looked directly out over the sea and the buildings retained attractive original features, including internal wooden shutters and parquet flooring. 26 Marine Parade, she said, had also, or she added this to its list of attractions, once been home to German author Uwe Jonsson. So this was a, a somebody trying to sell a house. Bishop's post was soon attracting comments from across the North Sea. She was surprised by the suggestion written in German that there might be something indecorous about using Johnson's name to increase the value of her property. And also by the query seeking confirmation that the interior of number 26 had been painted black in the writer's time. This vision in which the house appeared to alternate between a gloomy melancholic cell and the grimmest cell in a forced labor camp didn't accord with her recollection of the family home in which she had lived happily with her parents and two sisters for over 25 years. Her denials prompted her German speaking interlocutor to confess that he may have been taken in by an urban myth circulating in German literature classes. Having talked again with her mother, Bishop returned to admit that the wooden panelling on the wall out alongside the stairs heading down into the basement may well have been black when her parents bought the house after Johnson's death in 1984. When we spoke on the phone a few months later, she remembered that the lower walls inside the front door had been covered with a very dark paper of black and red. Quite hideous, really, she said. She also explained that German visitors had kept turning up throughout her childhood, photographing the house from the promenade along the seawall opposite sitting on the steps, knocking on the door and asking to be shown inside. Sheerness was not on the conventional tourist trail. It really isn't on the conventional tourist trail. But Bishop even remembers the odd coach pulling up so that rows of unlikely pilgrims could peer in at the windows. Her father had tried to accommodate this interest for a while, but it had all become a bit difficult. He was busy running his accountancy business from home and there was really nothing left for visitors to see. Meanwhile, the circumstances of Johnson's death in the house in February 1984 had, as the bishops knew, been miserable. When some of the authors of Maris in Germany sent Catherine's parents a commemorative plaque to mount on the wall, they decided against encouraging further attention and put it up in the kitchen they'd made on the lower ground floor inside. It would be the new owners who, having bought the house for rather less than Bishop's asking price, proudly granted the thing its intended place beside the front door. 
Now, that passage is a kind of indication of what I found as I started moving around this town. Sheerness is a town that was founded around a dockyard. It, the, it, the, Sheppey is a small mud bank downriver from London by 45 miles. It's, I say small, it's about 11 miles long and it's, it's and about sort of it's, at its widest, it's about eight, six or eight miles across. So it's got maybe 30,000 people living on it. Many more people come in the summer. It's like one of those downriver places you've got in New York as well of, you know, where people go out and they sort of spend time in bungalows and shacks. Um, but it's always been poor. What, what its industry was for 200 years was a naval dockyard, more than 200 years. It was set up in the 17th century and they built and serviced naval ships and they defended the Thames estuary. And this was closed after being the only employer really um, with its associated army garrison and all the rest of it. It was closed in 1960. So by the time Johnson arrives on this place on this particular land or piece of land, absolute low status. His friends tell him, you must be joking. You've got enough money to get a house in a better part of England. He's adamant that he likes it. He's, he comes from the GDR. He doesn't have that sort of bourgeois idea of what a place should be. He declares his solidarity with the unemployed, not just everyone there is working class effectively, but he goes for the, he goes for the people who are really victims of the circumstance. So he's, he's, there, there were quite a lot of GDR writers who came to England and likened it to a land of silver rather than a land of gold. It was, it was not sort of rampant capitalism in the 70s. It was, uh, it was still social democratic. It had a welfare state. It was a sort of, you know, halfway there form of capitalism. So I think, you know, I know that quite a few GDR people felt more at home there than they would have expected to do even in Dusseldorf, say in West Germany or in parts of the United States. So, but Johnson went further than that. He wanted the place because it was exactly what his friends thought was terrible. You know, every time people came and said, how can you live here? He just said how much he loved it. And so this, this sense was very interesting to me. I, I also discovered that when he left Berlin, or yes, he did leave West Berlin, he, he told his publisher he would have volume four of anniversaries done in a few months. I mean, it wasn't gonna be a long job. Um, so of course, you know, the fact that it took him nine years to actually get there indicates something fairly difficult was happening. But what I found as I walked around was that, you know, people knew nothing about him. He had left very little mark. Um, the people he had befriended and spent time with in the bars had all moved on, probably nearly all of them quite quickly moved on in a very mortal sense as well. So, you know, I found myself beginning to sort of, I was, for a while I didn't know, is there a big story here, is it small? My own direct experience was that I was in Kent, just inland from the Isle of Sheppey in the early 70s. I was a student there and I had read the early Johnson novels as a student in 72, 73, because they were published at that time by, you know, major American and also British publishers. So they were available and people were, were talking about them. And they were novels that seemed to me to imply a really interesting sort of, well, they just used the novels to talk about the division of Germany and the Cold War in a, a way that I thought was completely remarkable. And I still do. I mean, I think they were totally innovative works, the, the early novels. And so I was, I knew who he was and then I discovered later he'd moved to Kent and I thought okay that's interesting and when I heard that he'd moved to the Isle of Sheppey I was just staggered because it was the last place you would expect anyone of this sensibility and thought to, to settle. So basically that was my starting point and I, I suppose for years I mean I, I, I moved to Vancouver so I was living in Canada when I discovered that he was actually in Sheerness. So this was in the later 70s and even the early 80s. So I, I kind of kept the story in my mind, always thinking some much better qualified German scholar would, would be on the case. And of course it never happened. So when I got my job at King's, I mean, I'd been a self-employed writer for many years. So I, was, I didn't have a lot of leisure around things like grant applications and stuff. But when I got my job at the University in Kings, I thought this is the time to do this. So what I did was I raised some funding. I talked to Sir Kemp, the publisher in Frankfurt as they still were then and said, what can we do? And they told me, you've got to talk to Damien who had already translated. Um, he was, I think the, the anniversary project was underway. It was on the horizon and the, the Backman book and it, on the trip to Cla Klagenfurt book you'd already published. So we, we started at that point. So basically what I found myself writing was a book 
about Johnson, about his interest in these really weird peripheral landscapes. I mean, he's a great writer of the backwater. And what I found fascinating was that when he started talking about Sheppey, he often had places on the German Baltic in mind. He was thinking of, you know, sort of uh, spits. He liked coastal spits particularly. He was thinking of places in Fishland on the Mecklenburg coast on the Baltic. He, he might well have been thinking of Staten Island, which he liked particularly in New York or of, you know, islands or uh, islands offshore from Long Island or, you know, I mean, he was, he was a man who pulled together these places, which I think he associated with dereliction, yes, with, with poverty, with, with upper class contempt, all those things were features of some of these landscapes. But I think he saw them as places of a kind of truthfulness. And well, what really got me going on this was that Johnson once said he wanted to write a book of Kent stories, which he never wrote. So that was, that was my final cue, really. Well, what might those stories ever have been? What could he have talked about? You know, my experience of, of talking with you and working with you all these years and also reading your book and also just listening to you now, I, I really want to, to highlight something, which is, um, you know, from what you've been saying so far, people might get the impression that this book you wrote is really primarily a biography of this German writer. But, you know, I first heard from you when you emailed me out of the blue and said, I'm interested uh, in these uh, documents and letters and fragments that uh, he wrote about sheerness. You know, if I get funding, will you translate them for me? Maybe we can make it a book. And then over the years, I heard you saying, well, it's not going to be a collection of translations. I'm now writing my own book about sheerness. And even just now, you're starting to talk about Uwe Janssen, but then your voice comes alive and you talk about the dockyards and the sort of industrial history and the sort of sociological history of the island. And so like Janssen himself, you keep moving away from him towards the incredibly rich and surprisingly deep like lived reality of this place. And the book I think ends up actually being, I would say less than 50% a book about Uwe Janssen and Sheerness and more than 50%, all the stuff that you found once uh, you happened to turn your attention towards this place. And, you know, that's what's kind of so remarkable about it. It really turned from being Uwe Janssen in sheerness to being sheerness. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's true. I mean, my, my feeling about Janssen is that he became, for me, he was like this crazy, wonderful guide, you know, I mean, you could follow him yeah. around and, I mean, what, what are writers for? They're to read and to use and to think about. And what I was doing was trying to pick up his perspectives. I mean, I, you know, obviously I wasn't gonna be able to complete the island stories he once thought of writing, but never got around to finishing. Couldn't I, there's no question that one could do that. But I thought, well, let's take these perspectives and sort of both understand Johnson better by testing them out against the sort of place he found himself in, not entirely out of accident, you know? I mean, I don't think he chose Sheerness. I don't think he sat in, his place in West Berlin and said, I'm going to move to Sheerness. I think what happened was somebody said, here's some money, see where you can find a house. And Sheerness was cheap and it was right on the coast and he always wanted to live on the coast. So, but what I've tried to do is to sort of say, well, you know, what is the use of, of brilliant writers like Johnson? I mean, they, they have ways of seeing, they have ways of thinking. And of course he's sitting there reading Walter Benjamin. I mean, he's not, you know, he's not a, he's an intellectual writer. And um, so what I was trying to do is to find within his work a way of talking about a, a circumstance and a place in which we live now. And to me, the Isle of Sheppey, you know, I mean, I don't live there. I've been there a lot now, um, but uh, it's not a special place in some sense, but it is a revealing place. To me, it's an extremely prismatic place in which I think the truth of our time is, is uh, writ large. I mean, I think you, fi you find more about what's happened in this country by going to a place like Sheppey than by going to Westminster or, traveling around the country houses or the normal tourist route. And I think what, what, what Johnson reveals there is sort of how to think about place. And you know what he saw in the 70s 
was the beginnings of the culture that came through in Brexit. I mean, he saw all these people thrown out of work. He saw them living in a town that had once been the naval town of the British Navy. And there's no ships there left except for an American Liberty ship full of bombs that is threatening to blow the place up, sunk a mile offshore, you know, with its mast sticking out of the water. I mean, he saw all that. He saw this sort of history as debris, as detritus. And he saw the landfill world that we all live in. It's the English Rust Belt. We've all got these places, downriver, pellucid, full of history, which hasn't been sort of smoothed over or removed. Um, and, you know, these, this is, the, Sheerness is one of those places where what Johnson saw, which was these wild sort of semi-piratical lives um, amongst people with nothing, um, who were constantly out of work and all the rest of it, he saw those attitudes in which already, incidentally, they were saying the European Union is a very bad idea. Um, already in 1974, five. And he, so he sees an, an attitudes that could have gone either way. I mean, you know, they're, they're not intrinsically reactionary right wing or left. They're much more personal than that, but they could have gone in various political directions. And because of what's happened to our political culture here, we're talking in the age of Trump as well as of uh, Nigel Farage. Um, so it's obviously not just happened with us, because of the way it's gone, those, 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 that whole current of sort of rejected resentment, this sort of libertarian feeling of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm capable, but you've blown me out, is, has gone in that direction. So for me, there are three themes. There's Johnson, who I, I, you know, I'm nervous of, you know, I'm not a Germanist, so I'm nervous, but I did my best. I mean, I wanted to have the reason, I wanted to make it clear why this writing seems to me to be quite amazing. I've got the 70s to now, that span of history, and I've got this island which, I think, in a sense, we all have just around the corner, even if we don't live there. Wherever you are in the world, there's some rusted out town that used to have factories in it and people who knew what their lives were and all the rest of it. So I think in a sense that, that Sheppy is the world. And I think Johnson knew that. He called it a moral utopia, partly as a joke, because he knew everyone would think you must be mad, but also because he loved the solidarity of those people. He loved the fact that they looked after each other. He loved the fact that they didn't, you know, they knew what was going on around them. They were, they were, they were honest about a lot, even as they were dishonest about the law. Do you know what I mean? So, so he saw qualities there that um, I think are still there. You know, I mean, you can go to a place like the Isle of Sheppey and you will see positive images of white working class life. I mean, that, I, whenever you see them, you think, God, I haven't seen that for a long time because we're so used to this idea of degeneration and obesity and deprivation, but you see people living good lives with, in, under meagre circumstances. I mean, these are things we should know about. And for, for Johnson, he knew about that. He was at ease with it. I mean, that's what he did in New York too. You say that everywhere is Sheppy and even in the strand of anniversaries that takes place in Manhattan, He's visiting Spanish Harlem and the slums and talking about the slums around the corner in the Upper West Side of the 60s and, um, you know, taking trips past all the you know, walking trips to the East 70s through this total ghettoish wasteland that was like York Avenue back in the day and stuff like that. So that's true, you know. It is everywhere. Even even if you're writing about Manhattan, you can still choose to focus on that side of it. Yeah. Well, yeah, the Manhattan yeah. of the late '60s and early '70s was a rather derelict place in some ways. That's one of the interests of. Uh, um, tell us the story of the. I mean, your your book does in fact have a lot of sheerness stories in it, as well as some of the stories that uh, that Johnson told people in letters from sheerness to his friends in, in Germany and in America. But one of the most remarkable ones is the, sh is the story of the ship you mentioned, the Richard Montgomery, which uh, lies out in the harbor or in the mouth of the Thames there. Yeah, no, it's amazing. I mean, the letters are astonishing. The first one that completely knocked me out was Johnson's description, which he wrote for Hannah Arendt of sitting on the, he's inviting her to come and join him on the promenade at Sheerness and look at the Thames from, from his window. I mean, it, it, you think, what is going on? This man is sitting in Sheerness writing to Hannah Arendt in 1974 or five or whenever it is. So lots of things like that, very, very vivid, beautifully observed. I mean, this man is, is the sort of spirit of enlightenment incarnate. He knows how to see, he knows how to register. He knows how to sympathize while also being distant. I mean, so these are wonderful, 
forms of writing, I think, in, even in these passages which, which Damien has translated, we've got about 15 of them in the book. Um, but the, the, the Richard Montgomery is the big story for Jonson. And what this is, is, and this is the one piece he writes a long extended essay about. He did it for a book published by Jürgen Habermas, who asked him to, among other writers, to write about, he told him that the role of inter intellectuals is to clarify murky realities. So Johnson looked out of his window and he sees these three spike masks sticking out of the sea. And they are the remaining masks of the SS Richard Montgomery, which is a liberty ship, which came from Pennsylvania in 1744, across the Atlantic in a convoy, hideously dangerous job, as everyone who had clearly, you know, merchant marines had to sail those things and the submarines were everywhere. They got to London or they got to Scotland. They came round the Scottish coast, down the east coast of England into the Thames estuary. The man at the end of South End Pier, who was the naval commander running the whole of the Thames estuary, um, and this was on the other side, across the water from Johnson's house, saw this thing coming in and it was full of bombs, absolutely stacked seven meters high with bombs in all five different holds, I think maybe more. And they were all planned for moving, they were gonna take them onto Cherbourg to give them to the US Air Force to use in the, in the final year of the war, in the, in the sort of D-Day operation and afterwards. So this ship got misdirected to a sandbank mooring um, and it got, and the captain was a German born American called Willeke, you know, sort of went to sleep. Maybe he drank, he'd had a terrible time. The, um, the mate didn't do anything. He, the, the ship basically dragged in the wind and they all slept and it got beached. And because it was made of, and Johnson was very good on this because he researched the Liberty Ship Programme to write the essay. He said, you know, the, the thing is that they were making these guys like Henry Kaiser, who of course is in anniversaries, his funeral is in there, this huge multi-billionaire or millionaire who came out of the Liberty Ship industry, um, introduced these modular forms of production. So the, the Liberty Ship hull was welded, not riveted. So it had no flexibility in it. And what happens is when you get stress on it, it just cracks. So the hull split. So they couldn't get more than a small number of the bombs off and the thing was abandoned. So basically what you've got is a, is a story from 1944 to the present, this thing is still there, you know? Um, you've got this thing that would be capable of massive explosions. Yeah, you know? I mean, this is, a, this is an almost nuclear strength yes. yeah, it's concentration like, it's, of explosives yeah. that's yeah. sitting at the mouth of the Thames next it's, to it's, oil refineries. It's a few and yards. if the thing goes off, uh, yeah. the shock waves would like destroy Big Ben. I mean, we're seriously talking about, and it's out his window. He's looking at it. It's a, and, it's and he wakes up in the morning and there's, you know, Hiroshima. Uh, yeah, it's, window. It's, it's, it's the nuclear age. It's obviously a kind of allegorical sim yeah. I, I mean, uh, image too. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he was, he felt, in, you know, his friends or his sort of rival, the other German writers came and said, of course, he feels entitled to this. Because he's Uwe Janssen, he can have the apocalypse on tap. You know, people mock him. <laughs> he relished this thing. And of course, in Schiest, there's this wonderful culture around it. There are these great sayings like, you know, every cloud is a silver lining and the cloud is the flood. Because the other thing about Schiest is it's under seawater. I mean, it has no hope. It's dependent on massive sea defences, you know, because it was never meant to be there. I mean, this is a marsh that was meant to be left to cows and malaria mosquitoes, but because of the dockyard they built a town. So the whole place is implausible. And the, the risk of the explosion is what uh, Johnson thought about. And it, for him, it was like, it was history too. It was like, you know, unfinished business. And what I did in the book was, you know, because I'm, I'm writing the book out of European sources as I'm somebody who doesn't think Brexit is a good idea at all. And I was thinking about this terrible thing, which is basically, a 40 year long battle between the people of the estuary who are largely not well resourced and the state, various organizations of state authority, which are not prepared to try to move it. Twice the American maritime authorities have said, we think it's movable, but they've said, you've got to use British workers to do it. So <laughs> no British politician has, has said, we're gonna do it. So they just left it and it's been postponed and postponed and postponed. And this is a model of the people living under the power block which is extremely, you know, everybody in the Thames estuary knows about this thing. They know the history. They, it's shrouded in conspiracy theories because of course the government uses secrecy, which makes it worse because everyone just speculates as to what is actually going on, what's on board. So Johnson picks this up and he, he skims off the, he reads in the pub, he reads all this stuff in the pub about it. 
and he, he skates over the surface of British coverage and produces this beautiful argument which goes through the crack in the hull becomes the crack in the liberty bell and he makes all these sort of sideways shifts as he interprets this uh, story and produces really what is his best piece of sheerness writing and what I do in the book is sort of take that essay and read it back into a sequence in anniversaries which was about the Cap Arcona which was this you know liner that was used as a troop ship and then parked in the Bay of Lubeck the very end of the war completely crammed with concentration camp prisoners who had been you know by this time Belson had been liberated and you know two days after Hitler's death you know the very last days of the war the um the RAF come in with typhoon planes and they rocket it and thousands and thousands of people are just killed you know sinking these ships which are just floating part packed with people so it's an utter catastrophe at the end of the second world war which you know i i just thought we've you know what johnson effectively does by being for 10 years on the thames estuary is he he brings this international history right in there and he puts it down in front of you so the richard montgomery becomes the cap arcona i mean it's just great political writing it's not it's not a writing of the line I mean, political writing that is the line, it's always dreary and boring, even if you agree with the line, but it's proper political writing. It, 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 it takes you on, it gives you a sense of why the imagination still has power. And that's really what I wanted you know, to, um, to bring through. So in a sense, what I wanted was I wanted Johnson for, for England, not because I want to make any sort of chauvinistic claim about him, but I want, I want his intelligence to resonate here because I think it does so in a way that is, um, is unique and important. So that's why I wrote the book. Does either one of you want to read some of the, the uh, some of Johnson's writing about England? They know. Uh, I read the bit of, uh, of, that takes place in the pub. Yeah, I'd like. I you think to. that's a good one because that that's typical. So um, after his death, this book called Island Stories was published in German, where a scholar basically combed through the the Richard Montgomery essay, the three or four other little pieces he published. And then other than that, it's mostly letters. He was a very good letter writer, uh, very prolific in that realm too, and just had lots of great descriptions of here's what's going on in the letters. And so that was published as a book called Island Stories um, in German. And so here's a sort of typical one of them. Um, this is from a letter from 1981. And so you just have to imagine this in the middle of a letter and this is the part that was excerpted. Since the previous Friday too had turned to evening after weather that was partly sunny, but mostly blasted through with a cold wind, we'd gathered together in our male society referred to as a beer department store due to the prices for we had things to discuss. Charles comes in, the foreigner, so that we in the first paragraph turns out to be everyone else in the town, but not Leonson. Charles comes in, the foreigner, I've probably told you about him already, real names, something totally different, but who can pronounce German names like that? So we rechristened him, suits him pretty well by this point. Good evening, Charles. Good evening. <laughs> As we expect from him, he sits down on the far left stool, which we keep free for him till at least seven. And since the evening paper for Sheerness and the region was laid out for him there as usual, he dutifully starts reading. Windows broken in, TV stolen, gold watch for so many years of service until he notices a new sign hanging behind the bar. Do not throw cigarettes on the floor as people leaving on their hands and knees will be burnt. We know what's coming next. Charles pulled out his notebook and writes it down. Embarrassing to him, but we're used to it. It's one of those phrases that's hard to remember. And Charles apparently can't let that happen in his line of work, whatever that is, something to do with writing. Still, he does find it embarrassing to write in public. So he hurries to get it down and stick the notebook back in his pocket so that we'll forget about it. That's when he finally realizes that we were all talking at once, talking like crazy. Um, I don't know if I should go on, he gives the dialogue. Should Edwin, you decide, should I stop there or keep going? I'll read a little bit more. Okay. 
Just cut them off, cut their hands off, chop them off right here at the wrist. As a taxpayer, I represent the view that right you are, they just live off the dole. They just don't want to work. I say chop them off only for repeat offenders. The first time they should just break their arm under doctor supervision. By this point, Charlie had understood enough to realize that we're batting around a philosophical question, the ethics of the penal code. And he asks us the nature of the crime in question. We've been turned over, said one of the victims in an almost enthusiastic tone. They'd had a break in. They broke open the jukebox. The one-armed bandits drank all the bottles dry. And the telephone, Charles asked, did you report any calls? to the phone company? What? We say, what are you talking about, Charles? They could have called Yokohama on your phone. We just have to shake our heads at that. Only Charles could think of something like that. That's just how he is, which is an absolutely perfect yeah, joke very about Uwe Janssen, who's always coming up with these like weird, paranoid things that no one would ever think of. Uh, anyway, so it's hilarious that he, he calls himself out like that. I, I think they were just amateurs, Charles. Young people out for a good time. I, I'm not saying anything about anyone specifically, but the boys knew their way around. One of them could be standing right here in the room with us. Damn right. I have my ideas. I'll tell you that. They took all the rum, all the martini, vodka, eggnog, but left a bottle of whiskey untouched. That tells me something. A clue. Someone who couldn't drink whiskey, chop his hands off. Nah, another of the victims said. If they'd only have put the empties back on the bar though, they could have washed up a bit. That's the only thing I hold against him. And it goes on for a bit more. Yeah. It's great. I mean, it's, 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 it's absolutely excellent. To, to, partly because it shows that these people, these men in that, that pub or those two pubs that he frequented, the Seaview Hotel, because my title, The Seaview Has Me Again, is about the pub as well as the view, but the Seaview Hotel and the, and the Napier Tavern, these were working class pubs where people did know how to handle them. I mean, you look at the rows he had in West Berlin and the sort of terrible things that Max Frisch describes happening on an evening when he's had slightly too many work bottles of wine or whatever. Um, these guys could contain him at some level, but at the same time, they never really understood him. So one of the, you, that, that point about this man writing things down, I, I talked to an artist who was his neighbor um, a man called Martin Harris, who's no, no longer with us, but he said, you know, this guy, he was so aggressive. I said, what do you mean he was so aggressive? And he said, well, he was an impossible neighbor. Because whenever you met him, you, you say, you'd say something like, nice day, Charles. And he'd say, in what sense, nice day? And he'd say, he was always playing with words. He was always messing with your language. And, and you know, this was felt as aggression, but I said, no, 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 no. He was trying to work out your English. He was interested in the way you used words. And I think there was a great deal of that in the way people dealt with him. I mean, people did not get what he was about and he was not gonna reveal himself. I mean, I think Gunter Grass once said of him that he, it was vital to him to be a stranger. And I think he was a stranger everywhere, but mm. occasionally in those, those moments in the pub, perhaps less so than he had been in much of his life. But you kind of lose track until you think about it of the fact that he wrote that. I mean, he himself occupied the position of these people who didn't understand him, you know, and, and did it so convincingly. I mean, he really had that novelist skill of putting himself into these other lives and other minds, even the ones that seemed to be opposed to who he was. I mean, um, the fact that he, the fact that he describes himself in such a third person way and both insightfully and negatively, it's just, it's just amazing. And that's a lot of the energy of anniversaries as well, where the main character isn't in fact him, um, but engages with him and is a both an alter ego of some sort, but also this sort of equally perceptive um, viewer and observer of the world around her the female main character is of anniversaries. I think the other, the other point, that... just, just very quickly about these people in the pub was that he, 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 he did things for them. I mean, one of them got cancer and said he wanted to go to the Isle of Man and Johnson went, went to arrange a holiday and took him for a week. And 
he took another of these people to Staten Island. He came with him for on a trip to New York City. So, I mean, he did get he did get into a few of these people. They did become not exactly friends, but something quite close. People he people he cared about. He paid for the funeral of a woman who was, who was a pauper. You know, had no money at all. So he did he did do things like that quietly. Interesting. Why don't we uh, turn and take some questions now at this point? Of course. All right, I'm back. Um, so we will dive in. There was a great question that I wanted to start with and I'm just gonna find it one second. Um, all right, here we go. Nope, sorry, sorry. It is in the chat, not the Q and A. Um, <laughs> the question is, I like the digressive but finally structured character of the book. It is weaved in the way that complex novels like Janssen's are weaved. Um, can Patrick talk about the way he approached the composition of the text? Yes, I, I mean, that's why it took me eight years. Um, <laughs> I, started, I started digging. I mean, I always think of myself as closer to a sort of archeologist than a historian, really, in, that, in my engagement with places and historical archives and things. And, you know, I, I like to use the archive to surprise myself, not to confirm what I already know. So it's always a bit like following a piece of string. You pull it out and you don't know what's gonna come with it. And what I was doing with this book was I started writing it in pieces. And then I would try to work out how these sequences work together. And then I used the visual image a lot. So, I mean, this when I realized the view was a central device for Johnson in the composition of anniversaries particularly. And then I thought about views and I thought about the view of the, you know, so my book has views as well. So I followed a, a pattern of that sort. So basically what I did was I wrote a lot of the book before I, realized what I was going to put in it. Mm -hmm. And I came to the order in about year three or four. And then during the first lockdown, I sat down and, you know, for me, the first sort of COVID lockdown starting at the beginning of last year or February, March, was it happened in, in a very good way for me and a terrible thing to say, because I know it was a disaster, but I'd done all the research. I'd done a lot of drafts and I just sat at home and pulled it together and pulled it around and made sense of it. But no, the answer is that it's, it's a genuine, for me, the, 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 and I don't like calling books journeys because they're books, but there is a sense in which the research process and the finding out and the rethinking um, is absolutely, it's, it's open-ended. You don't know where you're going. I've never, I've never embarked on a book that I haven't finished. So it always works into something. But I never know, I wouldn't have known where I was going. You know, sometimes you find if the floor falls through you and you, you're seven, 17 centuries before you thought you were starting and things of that sort happen quite frequently. But I think it's, it's the only way you get a book with any life in it. Because if you get a book that is just nailed down to the idea of what the synopsis was, I mean, I've fallen out with esteemed publishers because my book was not like the synopsis, you know I mean? But I don't think any live book can be like the synopsis by definition, how can it be? Because you find things out as you go. So that is how I've done it. But, but it is for me that this particular book has these three aims, this period of history, which we really have to understand now, where in Britain, it's the end of social democracy. It's the end of the post-war new world and the beginning of this sort of kind of dis disruptive, weird, unsettled world we live in. Um, and then there's Johnson, who I just think is fascinating. And then there is this, this place. And I, I had to pull them all together as I could, really. I did write lots that isn't in the book. You know, I mean, but I, I will use that. Mostly I, you know, you do cut, you cut stuff out. Of course you do. I know it looks like a terribly long book, but it could have been far longer. <laughs> um, th this next qu question could actually be for, for both Damien and Patrick. Uh, does sheerness make its way into anniversaries, whether explicitly or covertly, or even are there just impressions around sheerness that might reveal itself in anniversaries? Well, Patrick, you wouldn't take that or? <laughs> yeah, I'll start on it. I mean, the answer is he never writes about Sheerness explicitly in anniversaries, but I think there are quite a lot of clues. There are quite a lot of um, phrases that appear in his letters that also, which are descriptions of Sheerness that in anniversaries volume four are applied to East German cities or towns, you know? So for example, he talks about a newcomer who you can always tell when somebody's new in town because they look at buildings rather than at people. <laughs> They've been around for a while, they know the people and that's what's interesting. So, and then he says that also early on in volume four about arriving in a new town in, in Mecklenburg in this period. So, and he, there, there, I mean, there are a lot of uh, 
discrete references like that. I mean, I think you can pick up references to his catastrophic marital troubles, which were, as far as I, who's to judge anybody else's life even years after the event. But, you know, my feeling, my sympathies were pretty much with the family rather than with Johnson, although he was obviously in difficulties. Um, but I mean, you can see phrases that in which he could be talking about that in Anniversaries 4. You find a very interesting set of, um, you know, sort of barbed mockery about English fellow traveling communists going into the GDR in volume four. And he was, he was played, the only time he wrote a letter to a newspaper in Kent mm. was after a dispute about, with this sort of crazy Stalinist who was saying the Soviet Union was brilliant <laughs> in the Kent Evening e Echo, you know. So, you know, you do feel that it's not as if, it, it, it's not as if it's completely not present. But I also have to say, I think he once talked about, um, the, the, he talked about the cellar of mem memories as the place that one of the many places the novelist has to go. And his basement workroom was a cellar of memories. And it looks empty in the photographs. It looked empty to the people who walked by and stared in at him as he sat, not finishing volume four for 10 years on his own in this house. But in his imagination, it was full of Staten Island, New York City characters. He called his characters invented persons because they had a sort of autonomous reality to him. They weren't just inventions. They had, they had existence in his, in his way of thinking. So he had an empty room that was teeming with places that were elsewhere. And I think it has to be said that's where he was. He was elsewhere in his, in his, in his comp compositional process. Does that make sense, Dave? That's such a great answer. I had, I had my answer too, but I, I can't follow that. So <laughs> let's just move on. I'll, I'll, ask a, I'll ask a true and, and, and rather straightforward question for both of you. Um, you know, in each of your experience reading, reading Janssen, um, what, what book, and it could be anniversaries, but what book of Janssen's has meant the most to you as a reader and scholar and, and, and thinker of Janssen over the years? Well, I'll, I'll say very quickly, it has to be anniversaries. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> I mean, it has to be. I, although I've loved some of the essays. Damien did some lovely translations, which we've yet to find a publisher for, of essays written in Berlin. There's a wonderful thing called Berlin Transit about the, which was published in Evergreen Review in early form in, back in the 60s. And it's, it's just this wonderful account of uh, a city which is divided before the walls divided. So people are still moving back and forth. And I think you could see how how having written that, that sense of a city that exists in two dimensions all the time and you never know which dimension is where and come to New York and you've got the color line. And you know, that's one of the brilliant things about this writer is that he went from the, the Iron Curtain to the color line. He, he managed to sort of make that transition where it wasn't just that the Cold War became more than the division of Germany, it took the world over. It was that that sense of kind of political polarization spread you know, into, into other domains in his imagination. So I think there are lots of wonderful, you know, occasional pieces that, you know, we must try and get a reader of these out because they are easy to read. They're quick, they're short, and yet they're absolutely, you know, classic pieces of thinking, literary writing. But yeah, it has to be anniversaries. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I will say that in Germany, his reputation is of having two great novels, the early one and the late one. So speculations about Jacob is regularly in, you know, it's like a it's like a Dubliner's Ulysses thing. It's regularly in the top books of the century and republished all the time and taught in schools. And uh, I think the sort of word on the street is that that's the great early book and anniversaries is the great late book. Um, but I, I I'm. I take the impolitic in Germany view that in fact, no, speculations about Jacob just is, doesn't stand up, that anniversaries with this organizing calendar of the days so that after a little three page gem of a chapter, he jolts the kaleidoscope around and then bounces Germany and New York off each other in a new way for another three pages and then does it again. It's just so vivid. And um, the, the central character of this woman is, and her daughter and their relationship is just so warm and loving and human and deep. And it just has um, so much that is missing from the earlier 
sort of more difficult Faulknerian books, which are great too, of course, but you've got to say anniversaries. Can I, can I just very quickly add to that? One other thing that I think is completely remarkable about anniversaries is as a way of dealing with history, I can think of nothing you know, more valuable at this sort of point in time we're living in because you know, what, what we live in a world where history is sort of about, you, know, you can just make it up. You know, I mean, high quality historical novelists think nothing of just making it up. Um, if there's a gap in the record, you just busk your way over it. But you know, what Johnson had was a way of thinking about history in which he, he used fiction as a, as a tool of truth, as a tool of getting to the root of things. And so he doesn't fake the archive. He uses the archive, he, he respects it. And he uses fiction as a way of closing in on it, of questioning it, of distancing it, and of asking for more and of going behind it. So I think as a model of how you think about history as a writer of fiction, he's completely remarkable. Or um, just as a citizen. I mean, I said this in print before the book came out in an essay. Uh, anniversary, and I, I definitely stand by this. I would say Anniversaries is the least post-truth book ever written. It is the most committed through its fictional tools and its non-fictional tools to really getting at what's there from all the, all the sides. And, and as, as Patrick just said, you know, not cutting the corners, not just making it up or, you know, papering it over with some good enough theory about it. But um, it's, uh, it's not just in a way um, using fiction to do sort of non-fictional truth investigation. It's that he had this incredibly um, non-fictional sense of his fictional characters. I mean, he wrote about running into his fictional main character on the street in New York and saying, oh, you know, maybe I can write my next novel about you. I've just turned in proofs of the last one. And he describes what side of the street she's walking on and why she's on that side of the street that day and how her fingers are holding her sunglasses that she's taken off her head. She is real. And when he's writing letters to his publisher about why volume three is swelling into volume three and four, he's like, well, this character just has a lot more that she remembers personally now that we've caught up to her teenage and adult life. So there's just more she wants to tell us about. And he even published an interview in 1972 with Marie, the 10 year old daughter who by 1972 is um, 14 saying, and, and I guess that does cycle back to the, how is sheerness important to anniversaries question? Because, um, you know, there, there are actually three time strata of the novel. There's the thirties into the forties and fifties, which is the main characters backstory and memories and what she's remembering and telling her daughter about. Then there's late 60s day-to-day -day life in New York, but especially in volume four, there's this ever increasing distance from eight, August 20th, 1968, when the book ends, he never flash forwards in the book, except once for like a minor character who dies a few months later. But other than that, he never flash forwards. And yet now, now it's 10 years later, it's in the seventies. So for example, everyone kept asking Uwe Janssen, like what happens after 1968? Like what happens to these characters? And in this interview that he does in 1972, the fictional girl has lived three and a half years after the end of the book that he hasn't written yet. And so it's very <laughs> playful, but also very serious about, you know, if these people are real, then by the time he finishes the book, they're 15 years older than when he wrote about them. And that's real for him too. He has this so tactile sense of history and these fictional characters moving in the world. Um, that's, what's so remarkable. And, and that's the way I would say his sheerness experience 
if not directly the place, you know, does fit into volume four. Because even though he's very strictly not writing as someone retrospectively looking back on 1968, in some sense, he's, he still kind of is. Yeah, he's also got this, um, I mean, the moral utopia idea is quite connected. I mean, it combines GNS almost with the, the very last moment in uh, volume four, which of course is the Soviet tanks going in to suppress the Prague Spring. And the, the idea of moral utopia, which he describes in GNS, which is mostly about the abandoned finding ways of living like human beings and looking after one another, legal or not, um, is similar in a way to the qualities he, descri he describes to the Prague Spring, where there is a kind of uh, truthfulness uh, and a, a belief in constitutional rights, all those things. So, so, you know, there are these interesting echoes back and forth between the world of the, the big world of the book and the tiny island of Shetty. So we have time for one last question. Uh, and Patrick, I'm gonna direct this your way. Um, it's because it's rather a personal question. So since you had lived in Kent for some time and 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 you know left for Canada and, and, then, and then returned to the UK, um, what were your feelings being from Kent and encountering Johnson's impressions of sheerness in the area, um, whether you were there doing your research itself, returning to it? Well, I was, I mean, I I was what happened to me at Kent was I went to, you know, I went to this new university which is one of the, the British had a sort of system of, they built new universities in the mid sixties, late sixties. And they became, there were seven or eight of them. Kent was one of them. And they were really interesting places to be. For, they're not so good now, I think, because they had to sort of conform in lots of other ways since, but they were innovative. They had these very interesting ideas of what the curriculum could be. They, they knew about the liberal arts from America. Uh, we didn't have those things in, we didn't have that approach. So there were, you know, it was an interesting time when Kent was a conservative county to be sure, but it was looking forward and it was full of this sort of energy and curiosity. And I stayed there for a year after graduating and I taught in a pretty chaotic, taught very badly in a very chaotic um, secondary school. And I thought I've had enough of this and got on a plane and spent five years doing a wonderfully slow MA in Vancouver because that was the way I, I had to stay registered to keep my student visa. So, and I educated myself in Vancouver and I'm grateful to Canada. I, I hadn't really been back much since. And in fact, they didn't let me in last time I tried to go, but um, you know, I learned a lot there. So I then went back to England and then I went back to Kent. And I mean, what I feel as I walk around Kent is this quandary, what happened to the possibilities of that time, the early seventies and Johnson comes across my, he comes back to my mind when I ask those questions through the Kent landscape. So, you know, I, I'm, I know Kent's a beautiful place. It's currently now a lorry park, of course, because of the troubles with the, the new borders and things. But, um, you know, it's, it's basically a place where you still have this rich, you know, world full of people who live in mansions that were funded by slavery and imported sugar and all the rest of it. And then this sort of literal area literal as in on the edge of the water on north and south of beaten up abandoned towns that are struggling so you know i mean you just see the brutality of it so for me i'm i'm aware of that as a kind of condition that we have to think about in this country and try and do stuff about um and i find johnson just a, a brilliant outside figure you know he comes in from another planet and yet he sees it so precisely and so exactly so it's just a rich experience and the, the great sadness is that his life went so terribly wrong. I mean, you know, basically this is a man who destroyed his own marriage and who drank himself to death. Um, but what I, you know, I tell that story in the book, I mean, how can you avoid it? But it's not the story. I mean, the story is this brilliant uh, political literary imagination, uh, which is, as I said, sort of enlightened and ironic and distanced, but capable of extraordinary sympathy as well. And that's that's what I like. And you know, with people like that around any any place, even the Isle of Sheppey, perhaps especially the Isle of Sheppey, is better. Well, that's enough uh, uh, time that we have for tonight. Um, Damien, Patrick, thank you so much for your time. Edwin, as always, thank you for helping us guide the conversation. 
Um, again, uh, uh, the book is for sale from the bookstore. I posted in the chat at the beginning of the program if you want to click on the link. We also have a link to anniversaries if you've not gotten to that yet. Uh, though we've sold so many copies of that over the last few years, I doubt that any of you are lacking. Um, so again, thank everyone for, for joining us this evening uh, and for joining us for our first event of 2021. And we will be back for more. Um, again, Patrick, Damien, Edwin, thank you so much. Have a lovely night. Stay safe. Uh, Good night. We'll do more. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye. Congratulations, Patrick. Yes. Thank you, and to you, and thank you for helping out so wonderfully. <laughs>